on Lesson 5 today. Um, from this point on, we're going to be looking at more than one apostle at a time. Uh, if you have a chance to read ahead, I encourage you to do that. Uh, if you have any pertinent questions, I'll try and answer them the best I can. Um, and then we will be in the fellowship hall again next week. So just kind of a, we'll try to remind you from week to week where we're meeting the following week. But we're in the fellowship hall next week. And then because of the rummage sale, we'll be back in here the week after that. So, all right. So as we get started, we're got your Bibles ready. We're going to be looking at a few passages today, especially in the Gospel of John. Um, Because really, John gives us more information about the other apostles than the three synoptic Gospels do, uh, which I suppose, having read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he said, well, Holy Spirit, what else do you want people to know about this time period? And he came last, so he gives us more information that the other three didn't cover, so... Um, All right, everyone ready? Let's start with prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day as we are in a time of changing seasons here. We are reminded that your church has endured changing seasons and changing places throughout the ages. You promised that your elect will be kept safe until you return. And so we ask, Lord, that you'd continue to be with your church here on earth. Keep her strong in your grace and truth. Help us not uh, give in to the idea that we need to protect ourselves from the world, but help us to see that you are protecting us and that you have sent us out into the world with the truth so that they too may know it and be free in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We are going to look at two apostles today, Andrew and Matthew. Um, the, the stained glass up on the screen, it, it does uh, give us a sense of how people have illustrated the apostles down through the ages. This actually comes from the stained glass windows of St. John's Episcopal Church in Salisbury, Connecticut. Um, they have pictures for all of the Apostles. I thought that was kind of a, a cool find on the internet. Um, just the different ways that artists have rendered them. Um, and we're going to see from what we study today how we know the first one's Andrew and the second one's Matthew. Okay? Um, so, these two apostles are presented as comparable in personality and characteristics in the Gospels. As we read about these apostles, listen for the way they receive the Gospel how it motivates them for kingdom work, and how it flows out in their lives. So who was Andrew? Well, what we learned about Peter's background information will apply equally to his little brother Andrew. Like Peter, Andrew had been born in Bethsaida on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. He later shared a home with Peter in Capernaum. And we get that from the Gospel of Mark. Remember that? kind of became Jesus' home base during his Galilean ministries. His mother's name was Joanna, and his father's name was John. Literally in the Hebrew, it would have been the word Jonah. Um, Andrew had been a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, and something in his nature, however, was not content with the life of a fisherman. He felt a calling to do more in the realm of his spirituality because you know big brothers got the family business so what am i going to do with my life right um and so we find him uh exploring that along the banks of the jordan river in john chapter one and so i'm going to read these verses out loud you can follow along and then we'll pause after we get through them and this is the testimony of john the baptizer When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ, the Messiah. 
And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one who you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. And the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. What time is that? If the day starts at 6 a.m., about 4 p.m., right? Um, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was, ta-da, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, had been a disciple of John the Baptist, okay? Who was the other disciple? John, son of Zebedee, right? We looked at him last week. All right. Uh, Andrew was the first of the disciples called by Jesus and had been a disciple of John the Baptist when he heard John declare for a second time that Jesus was the Lamb of God, Andrew left his former teacher and followed after Jesus. Where was the invitation? Did you catch it? Where was the invitation from Jesus for Andrew to follow him? Come and see. <laughs> Where are you staying? Come and see. And they spent the whole afternoon with him, right? Um, I can't imagine Jesus, who never owned a house, had more than a tent or something that he was staying. And I don't know if you've seen the, the Chosen, but they kind of picture that. He's like out in the woods, right? Um, living off the land. That's probably what it was. There's not too many trees close to the Jordan, but he must have found something for shade or some kind of tent to pitch, right? Um, and so they spent the afternoon with him. Um, Andrew was uh, not only the, the first of the disciples called by Jesus, had been a disciple of John the Baptist, but when he heard John declare for a second time that Jesus was the Lamb of God, Andrew left his former teacher and followed after Jesus, and later, Jesus would call him to be his disciple and an apostle. We talked about that in the first lesson that they actually followed him as disciples for a year before he pulled them out of the other disciples and said, you 12 are going to be apostles during the second year of his ministry. 
Okay. So what was Andrew like? Well, Andrew was never a disciple who pushed himself into the forefront. He's only mentioned by name 14 times in the New Testament, most of which simply list his name. He is presented as an inquisitive introvert. So if you're an introvert, you can kind of connect with one of the apostles here. But in his own unassuming way, he was active in bringing people to Jesus. The biblical record concerning Andrew revolves around three incidents. In each one, he brought someone to Jesus. So if you read ahead, don't spoil it for the people who haven't. Okay. First John 1, 40 to 42. So this follows the text we just read. We just found out that Andrew was one of John the Baptist's disciples, right? And as soon as he comes to know Jesus, what does he do? Um, so John picks up there. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Hey, come on. <laughs> you know, Peter's probably not going to follow his little brother unless there's a little more encouragement, right? Um, Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, okay? So having just met Jesus, okay, spends the afternoon with him, realizes John the Baptist said he's the son of God, the lamb of God, who's going to take away the sin of the world. He's the Messiah, what does Andrew do with that information? He goes back to where? Probably Capernaum. Where his brother was, right? Come, you got to meet this guy. Okay? Um, it seems like it's just, you know, the next day, but this is probably... A few days where he travels, grabs his brother, says, You gotta follow me, you gotta meet this guy, he's the Messiah, right? This was a lot of effort. It doesn't sound like much in John's gospel, but think about where they were along the Jordan. He's gotta go all the way around the Sea of Galilee, get to Capernaum, where we know Peter had a fishing business, and drag him back to meet the Messiah. Okay? All right, the next one in the next time we see Andrew active in the Gospel of John is chapter 6. And there, um, lifting up his eyes, then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each one of them to get a little. A morsel, right? One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Now at this point, I think Andrew knows what Jesus can do. And he brings this little boy with his lunch basket and he says, well, what are you going to do with this, Jesus? And what did he do? Multiplied it so everybody got more than just a little more so. They were full and there were 12 baskets full of food left over. They had leftovers. 5,000 men and their wives and children could have been up to 20,000 people there. They just counted the men, 5,000 men, right? Um, so Andrew doesn't boast and brag. He's not bold in his statements like Peter. But boy, look at this faith. He says, hey, Jesus, what can you do with this? Right? All right, last one. 
The third time we see him in John's Gospel is in chapter 12. Um, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. What does that tell you about Philip's understanding of Andrew's personality? He'll get the job done. Someone's got to have answers. Well, maybe I'll go check and see what Andrew thinks because he seems to know stuff. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. You remember what happened after that? Jesus rejoiced because the good news was not just reaching the children of Israel, but the Gentiles as well already, right? And Andrew was bold enough to say, well, you know, you didn't just come for us. So here, I want you to come meet some Greeks. Right? That tells you a lot about Andrew's personality, right? Yes. I'm not saying he didn't have people skills, but when he uses them, he's very direct, right? He doesn't even say anything. He just does. He brings people to Jesus. It's not me you got to worry about, Andrew says. I want you to meet the most important person you're ever going to meet. And his name is Jesus. I know quite a few introverts that wouldn't volunteer for an evangelism committee, but in their personal relationships, they're willing to say, look, you're my best friend, but I got someone who's even more important. And that personal relationship bridges to sharing Jesus Christ. Okay? So if you're introverted, look to Andrew and say, look, Jesus used him. He can use me, right? Um, Andrew appears to be a humble and helpful worker in God's kingdom. He was always ready to serve without selfishness and without seeking his own glory. Obviously, he's included when we read about the 11 and the 12 in the Gospels and the book of Acts. Scripture does not tell us where Andrew ministered after Pentecost or how he died. Um, Outside of Scripture, the early church reported that Andrew preached the Gospel in Asia Minor, so modern Turkey, in Greece, and beyond. What does that mean? Well, we don't really get any more information until the 3rd century when Eusebius, in the history of the church, recounts that Andrew went to Scythia, a region in modern-day Russia, near the Black Sea. Um, So if you're a map person, um, where is Scythia? So in in Jesus' day in the first century, that's where Scythia was, north of the Black Sea. Um, What's that? Yeah, Ukraine would have been included in that too. Yeah, right? So um, it, it would have expanded all the way up into what we consider Russia today. Um, so I don't know how far he went into Scythia, but he's the one whom the early church recognizes as the apostle who went north and east like that. So, all right. Um, Andrew's symbols. A fourth century account reports that he was crucified at Petras in Greece about the year 69 A.D. Who was emperor at that time? Right at the end of his reign. Nero. So this is during that first empire-wide kind of persecution of Christianity um, when Peter was 
executed when Paul was executed. Remember that? Uh, it's the same time period. When the wife of the governor was converted by Andrew's preaching, so the story goes, the governor in anger ordered him crucified. He was crucified on an X-shaped cross known as a saltir cross, which had two ends planted in the ground. And tied to that cross, he preached for three days before he died. Accordingly, this cross is known as the St. Andrew's Cross. And it's really the main symbol when you think of uh, the saints, the, the, the X is tied to him. He is the patron saint of the Russian Orthodox Church. He's also the patron saint of Scotland and was the patron saint of Imperial Russia. Um, so that symbol you'll see a lot in the East because they, they say that their connection to Christ came through Andrew. Okay? Um, it's not known exactly where Andrew's body was laid to rest, but around 357, Emperor Constantine had Andrew's body moved to the Church of the Holy Apostles in Constantinople. According to Mary Sharp's A Traveler's Guide to Saints in Europe, Pope Pius II transferred Andrew's head to St. Peter's in Rome in 1462. In 1964, Pope Paul VI gave St. Andrew's head to the Greek Orthodox Church in Patras. And some of Andrew's remains may have also been interred in Russia. Because, you know, God's going to be able to find all the body parts anyways. So. Um, there's actual early historical evidence that they knew where his body was and that these are really the remains of St. Andrew. Okay? I'm going to pause there for a second. Any questions? Yes. Andrew was Peter's younger brother. We don't know the age difference. Um, probably a few years, yeah. It's, it's very apparent when you read the Gospels, the way they refer to him, Peter's brother rather than Peter being Andrew's brother. There's, there's a, a lineage kind of marker there. Yeah, it was cultural, yep. Because the big brother got a double portion of the inheritance and he had to carry on the family name and the family estate. And the family business, usually. Okay? Yeah, oh yeah. The other brother knew that all along. Um, which, when you read um, Jesus' story about the prodigal son, that's what we call it, right? The prodigal son. It's really about two brothers, right? The older brother and the younger brother. So the younger brother only gets a third of the estate. The older brother's left with two thirds and when the younger brother comes back, he doesn't want to share any of it with his younger brother, right? Um, it's mine, Dad! <laughs> okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Bruce? Yes. Um, the, the arms were nailed or tied to the, the upper portion of the Celtier cross, and the legs were either tied or nailed in. I mean, it's still crucifixion. Ultimately, what's going to happen is your body's going to, the weight of it's going to crush your lungs and your heart's not going to be able to do all the, the beating. You suffocate to death. A slow, slow, painful death. And if it's true he was preaching for three days, he wasn't going to, you know, misuse the last three days of his life. He was going to give it his all, right? Um, so, uh, other symbols. Um, the second most utilized symbol is two fish in the shape of an X or with an X shaped cross behind them. So you can kind of see that one on the top there. Um, 
that's symbolizing Andrew's past as a fisherman and the cross on which he died. The third mixes the cross with a fish hook. So, again, who uses a fish hook? A fisherman, right? <laughs> so, um, those are the, the most common symbols for Andrew. So, all right. Now, on to Matthew. If I'm moving too fast, let me know. All right. Matthew. Any of you have someone in your family named Matthew or middle name Matthew? Yeah? Okay. A few of you? What does it mean? What does the name Matthew mean? Anyone know? Gift of God, right? Um, Theos is the Greek word for God. Matteo is the verb to give, to gift. So Matthew is a gift of God, a gift from God. Um, which is very interesting that he takes that name because that wasn't his given name. That was not the name he was born with. Um, this apostle was notably the only untouchable apostle called by Jesus into the training for public ministry. He was a tax collector by trade, and tax collectors, also called publicans in other translations, were despised by the Jews because they worked for the hated Roman government and took money from their own people, often even more than the Romans required in taxes. Um, and they had Roman soldiers to back them up if there was any problems. They'd just go to the local garrison and say, hey, this person isn't paying the taxes I want from them, so go rough them up and get it out of them. And if that didn't work, what could a tax collector do? Put him in jail? And if he could prove debt? Throw him and his family in debtor's prison. They had power, okay? Um, and it had to do with the pocketbook. Um, so, they were counted among the worst of the open sinners by the Pharisees. In the eyes of Jewish society, they were on the same level with prostitutes. That's how bad they saw them as being morally, okay? Uh, after Jesus had called James and John, Andrew and Peter, they stopped along the highway near Capernaum, and the Lord called Matthew. So what do we learn about Matthew from these passages? His name, well, he's named two different names. Um, in Matthew chapter 9, you have his given name there. Um, as Jesus passed on, or not his given name, his, his Greek name. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Um, now, Mark's account for this uses his given name, so the birth name he had, okay? Mark says, and as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Okay. He might be related to the other James, James the Lesser, because the father of James the Lesser is also Alphaeus. So we've, we know two brothers for sure, right? James and John. We find out Andrew and Peter are brothers. Would it be that surprising that Jesus chose two other brothers? Levi and James? Possibility. Um, Professor Corthels put the note in there, prob not, which I'm assuming means probably not. Uh, and I think his, his logic would be there were, were other people known as Alphaeus. Um, it was not that uncommon of a name in the historical record, so... That's the, that's the term the church uses for him. We had to distinguish him from James, the son of Zebedee, 
And so we call James the son of Zebedee, James the greater, and the other James who doesn't get as much playtime in the Gospels, we call James the lesser because we know less about him. But that doesn't mean he's any lesser in, in the, the numbering of the apostles, right? He's still one of the 12. Good question. All right. Um, where did he live? Well, Mark chapter 2 gives us the best. Uh, when he returned to Capernaum, this is Jesus, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Now, Jesus didn't own a home. Whose home was he using? Peter's home, right? Um, and then at the end, or in verses 13 and 14, he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Um, yes? Well, I have a feeling being in Capernaum, he knew Jesus by now. Jesus was teaching, preaching, healing. He knew who Jesus was by word of mouth at least. And maybe even had seen him teaching because that was his hometown, right? Um, but yeah, to give up your whole business. And you're already, I mean, if you watch The Chosen, he's already kind of a castaway, right? Like nobody wants to deal with him except the Romans, right? That, that probably was very true. So now you have this rabbi saying to someone who's really untouchable, you follow me. Okay, I'm going to give up all my security and follow you. So that shows you, you know, he recognized Jesus as someone really important, right? Yes. So when he was called to be an apostle, yes, he, th this is before, so he calls Matthew to follow him as a disciple. And then during his second year of ministry, Jesus is on the mountainside and he calls 12 of the disciples to him and says, I'm going to make you apostles. So there was definitely a distinction from the other followers of Jesus there is a span of time. Yeah, we, yeah. Matthew wasn't a fisher, he was a tax collector. Andrew was a fisher, yeah. Andrew had already left fishing, it seems like. He had been following John the Baptist. He was trying to figure his life out. And he had the freedom to do that because his big brother was running the business. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They leave the business at that point. At the very beginning, in the first year, that's true. Um, John goes back to fishing with his brother because when they come to Capernaum again and Jesus is ready to, to launch from Capernaum, he, he grabs James and John and Peter and Andrew and they leave. It says James and John leave their dad in the boat even. like They were, they were doing the work. No, they definitely had exposure to Jesus, right? Yeah, it was a developing, that's a good way of putting it, a developing relationship. And then he comes to say, you need to follow me. And at that point, they literally give up their means of income and they follow him. Yes, Matthew could have had some kind of a relationship before yeah. Of course, it is the Son of God, so I have a feeling if he speaks a word, we're going to do whatever he says anyways, right? Just follow me. Okay. 
I'm coming. <laughs> so it is. Zacchaeus was also a tax collector. That's right. But that's towards the end of Jesus' ministry. Well, he wanted to know about Jesus too because who's this guy that can for, forgive sins, right? You can think of the guilt that Zacchaeus was carrying around and he would have been treated the same way as Matthew as a, as a tax collector, right? And it tells us not only was he a tax collector, but Zacchaeus had the title chief of tax collectors, right? So he had to go around to all these little villages and towns around Jerusalem and get money and bring it to um, the, the, the Romans. So he would have had even more ways of squeezing money out of his brothers and sisters, right? So, all right. So, Andrew, Matthew. Matthew is different because his life experience is different, but they're from the same town, basically. He, he seems to have grown up and lived in Capernaum. We don't find any other distinction. Like, we, we learn that Peter and Andrew were originally from Bethsaida, but business was better in Capernaum, and that's where they set up shop, right? Um, they buy a house there, right? Um, okay. So he was a tax collector. Little else about Matthew's past life is recorded in Scripture. Also called Levi, joined, or Matthew, gift of the Lord. He was a Jewish tax collector at Capernaum. Matthew would have served at that time under King Herod Antipas in Capernaum of Galilee, collecting tariffs on goods passing along the road from Damascus to the Mediterranean Sea. And so I don't know how familiar you are with first century Roman highways. Uh, you can't see it that well. But you can kind of see the Sea of Galilee, right? And you see that yellow line that cuts across the screen? That was the main highway for the Roman, um, between garrisons, it was the, the main highway that was used for trade, Okay. Um, and so Matthew had a spot, we might call it a sweet spot, for being a tax collector, right? Passing through my town, you've got to pay the, pay, the, pay the tab, right? Um, pay the tax. Um, to function in this capacity, Matthew would have been a fairly educated man, acquainted at least with the Greek language as well as the native Aramaic. These gifts he would later use to write his gospel... As a tax collector, Matthew may have been a man of wealth, but this occupation also caused him to be despised by the Jews and considered among the lowest of people. The Pharisees consistently spoke of tax collectors in the same breath with sinners. Right? Not us holy Pharisee people. They're sinners. Um, since Jesus was using Capernaum as his headquarters during his public ministry, Matthew had undoubtedly heard about Jesus and his miracles. Perhaps he had even witnessed the Savior in action. And Jesus called Matthew while he was working at his toll booth. Jesus passed by on the road and said to him, Follow me. Matthew left everything and did so. And we get that from Luke's Gospel. Okay? No, Levi would have been a, a common Jewish name. He was Levi was one of the twelve sons of Jacob of Israel. No, that, we don't seem to have any reference that he was a Levite. But you know, a name of ancestral importance. Yeah. Correct. Yep. And then if they were, if they were, if they excelled them from like 12 to 19, they would go. Depending on the school of theology. Okay. So the Pharisees had a very structured program in the leading up to Jesus' time. For two centuries, the Pharisees developed a very dedicated path to become not only a scribe, but also then you could become a, a religious leader, a Pharisee, right? Um, so 
we might, I mean, if we compared it to New Testament ecclesiastical hierarchy, you know, the, the Pope would be the, the high priest, and then the Sanhedrin would have been the, the council of bishops, right? Um, and then your priest would have been the, the local guy who carried out the work in the, in the um, synagogues. So synagogues were the local, but then for the temple stuff, you had to go up to Jerusalem to offer the sacrifices. So it was very structured. Pharisees were very conservative religiously. In fact, they not only held to the Scriptures, but they made 325 other laws on top of that you had to follow, right? Um, so... Uh-huh. So if they, if, they didn't, um, if they weren't called by a rabbi like when they were like 19, then they would go back to the family. Well, it, most of the time the trade was something that you learned in your home. And if you were the oldest son, you would take over the family business. Unless the, the oldest son decides to become a rabbi and leave that to your younger brother James. <laughs> so, then, so then what I learned, and I, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but okay, so Matthew was okay, if he was supposed to be in the uh, in the temple doing something and he didn't do so hot in you know rabbi school and all that stuff, then he was a disappointment to his family too, on top of being a tax collector. Well, we don't know, I mean, there's a lot of speculation there. We don't know much about his family situation. Um, we do know that he becomes a tax collector. And he actually has a name change, which is probably something he chose for himself to fit in better with the Gentiles. Because Matthew is actually Greek. And it would have made his access to the Gentiles a little easier. And I assume he probably didn't dress like the traditional Jewish person either. They probably wore more Roman attire. Um, so I think most, most movies and shows I've seen Matthew displayed as wearing attire that the Jewish people would have worn. I don't think that's the case. He takes on a Gentile name. He probably dressed like a Gentile. Um, but he was born a Jew. So, and it probably was some family disconnect there because of his choice. Question? So, we, we have a little actual, uh, discussion about first century rabbis, different schools of theology that develop. And so you have your mainline branches. You've got Pharisees and Sadducees, right? And then you'd have these itinerant preachers who would pop up and say they're both wrong. This is what God's really saying. So Jesus was not that different from other rabbis who had popped up and became... He did his circuit preaching, right? He goes around and says to the local synagogues, you know, these guys and these guys, they got a few things wrong, but I'm going to set you straight. And oftentimes then, they would have followers who come after them and learn from them, sit at their feet, and, and then become preachers themselves, rabbis. So that's kind of what was going on in the day of Jesus. So you understand, when Jesus walks into a synagogue, and they're like, oh, we got a we got a guest preacher here today, right? <laughs> Why don't you come and read for us, right? It wasn't that uncommon uh, if they were recognized as a rabbi. So, But he was the prophet. The question that the Pharisees were asking Jesus comes from the book of Deuteronomy where, where Moses himself says, God's going to send a prophet from among you. You must listen to him. Jesus was the prophet that was foretold. So another thing that was significant about the word follow me is you, you couldn't go to a rabbi and say, I want to study on you. 
As, as, as far as my understanding, it was the rabbis who chose the, the students, the followers, because as he talked with them, they were inquiring and they wanted to know more. And he said, you're going to follow me and you're going to learn then. So, so that would be very significant. Yeah, yeah, it would be very significant. And we, we only have a few instances where Jesus says, follow me, but we find out in the Gospels he had 70 disciples that he had called to follow him. And from among the 70, he chose 12, right? Okay. Um, all right. So what Matthew does next after he's called tells us a great deal about him. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 27 After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick... I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So if Jesus wanted to be popular with the people, choosing a publican as a disciple would not have been a good move. The Savior, however, was not concerned about popularity. Rather, he was concerned about souls. Matthew was a man who responded immediately to Jesus' call. Moreover, he was anxious to share the good news. He wanted to reflect some of that same compassion which Jesus had shown to him. Matthew reached out to those who are spiritually sick and in need of the great physician. Don't miss that. Who does he invite to this banquet he's serving for Jesus? Other tax collectors. They needed to know they were loved by God just like he was, right? Although we don't hear much about his personal activity as an apostle in Scripture, the Lord used Matthew to write one of the Gospel accounts. Since Matthew was a Jew, he wrote with other Jews in mind. His Gospel spends much time discussing the Old Testament prophecies and pointing out how Jesus fulfilled them. So among the four Gospels, Matthew's Gospel was the one that was pointed specifically at the Jews saying, look, this is the Messiah. He becomes the mouthpiece to his own people who probably wanted nothing to do with him, right? Um, Eusebius, quoting one of the church fathers, Irenaeus. Irenaeus was basically two generations removed from the apostles. And he wrote, Matthew published a written gospel for the Hebrews in their own tongue while Peter and Paul were preaching the gospel in Rome and founding the church there. This would date Matthew's Gospel around the early 60s A.D. Outside of Scripture, there is early recognition that for eight years after the ascension of Jesus, Matthew proclaimed the Gospel in Judea. The early church fathers related that Matthew continued his ministry by preaching in Ethiopia and Arabia. So if we can put that map up there. So you can see in the very lower part, Matthew... Matthias, they go all the way down to Ethiopia, okay? Um, An ancient writer reported that Matthew died a martyr's death in Ethiopia sometime around 68 AD. According to the account, Matthew was killed by beheading with a halberd. It was a long spear that was fitted with an axe head um, in Nadaba because of the number of converts at his preaching. It is probable since no other early account or tradition denies it. Um, and the most common symbols for Matthew reflect his former occupation. Three money bags remind us that he had been a tax collector before he became a collector of souls for the Savior. Sometimes a symbol for Matthew is an axe, the instrument of his beheading. Another symbol is a banded money chest. Why? Got to protect the money you collect, right? (laughs) Um, Another symbol for this apostle depicts a book indicating his authorship of a gospel and a winged creature with a man's face. Right out there. You can see it from right here. 
Matthew's Gospel, right? One of our stained glass windows of the four evangelists right out there. That's Matthew. Okay? Um, any questions so far on Matthew? Oh, as far as like in our English Bibles? Right. So I'm going to tell you something. That was a printer's choice. <laughs> um, the scrolls were not in any specific order. When they pulled out the scroll of Matthew, they knew they were reading from Matthew. Um, we have it in a codex, which is what we call a book, right? And we've got to put them in some kind of order or sequence. And most publishers have to make a decision, how are we going to order these 27 books that we call the New Testament? So, and I think Matthew just kind of stuck because his is the one that says Jesus is true God and true man. Descendant of David, right? Yep. Yeah. It, it probably, historically, Mark's Gospel probably came first. But Matthew's is much more detailed. Yep. Okay. Should we look at the discussion questions? Luther once said, let me have a church of Andrews of simple loving men and women content to bring others to Jesus. Is a church of that nature more desirable than a small evangelism committee among the whole church? What are your thoughts? Yes. We'd have to have a building program if each one of us brought one person, right? <laughs> okay. There's nothing wrong with an evangelism committee because obviously you have some people who like to study and learn how do I share the gospel in a specific way and address certain questions or doubts, right? And there's some people who are very gifted with that. Um, in fact, the Bible actually calls that type of person an evangelist, right? One who shares the good news, right? But we are all evangelists to the people that God has placed around us, right? We are the light shining in the darkness, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? And we do that as we bring others to Jesus, too. I want to tell you why I am the way I am. Right? Because of the one who is. Um, and as we share the good news, we know the promise of the Holy Spirit. One, when you have to testify, He's going to give you the words to speak. Okay? Two, when you share His word, it's not you doing the work, but the Holy Spirit doing the work. Just bring them to Jesus. Be like Andrew. I'm not going to be bold and be like my big brother, Peter. I'm just going to drag people along and say, here, I want you to meet Jesus. Okay? So I would say both and. What do you think? I like Luther think this is really a good look at when we see that personality touched by a Savior, doesn't become, you know, flamboyant, simply just says, come, come with me, I want you to meet somebody. All right, number two, consider what Matthew did when Jesus called him to be his disciple. What did he do? He invited his friends and he gave them access to Jesus, right? So how can we give Jesus access to our friends also? 
Pray, pray for them. Yeah? Invite them to church. Hey, come on, I want you to meet somebody. Why do you go to church? Well, there's some pretty nice people there, but that's not the reason I go. I go because we all know this other person. Jesus, the Christ, right? By our actions, yeah. Um, one of my favorite quotes is John Wesley. I know he's not Lutheran, but he said, preach the gospel to all the world and when necessary, use words, right? Um, speak the truth in love, yep. Feeding people. Take care of the stomach and they might be open to hearing about what's good for their soul, right? But no, I think that's true. That's the, the, the love in action, right? I love somebody. It's not just going to be in words, but also in deed, right? Um, both. Now we could have all sorts of acts of kindness and mercy. Don't get me wrong, those are good things. But if we stop short of introducing people to the reason why, introducing them to Jesus, then we miss the boat, right? We've got to do the second part too. We've got to tell them, this is Jesus. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because He loves you. That's why I loved you and helped you in this situation. When I show mercy, it's because, first of all, I know a God who shows us mercy, right? So in Andrew and Matthew, we see an introvert and an outcast saved by Christ. They loved the Lord and followed Him faithfully. We also see in them a common desire to touch other souls by bringing them to Jesus. And so hopefully that inspires us also. If God can use an introvert and an outcast, He can use us too. All right? Let's close with prayer. Lord, You know us. You know every thought on our minds before they even become words on our lips. You know our intentions. You perceive our actions before we even move into motion. You are a God who not only knows us, but loves us. We thank You for showing us today how You touching the lives of Andrew and Matthew was good for Your church. Help us to see that You are still the God who saves today. A God who has placed us where we are so that we might bring others to You as well. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. All right, next week, Fellowship Hall.